chance. We've got uh, four top experts. Anything you like. Open house. Who'd like to start? Any starters? Yep, one on the front row here. Get the ball rolling. Richard Crew from England. Uh, my question with the tank um, back in the uh, demonstration session. All I would ask is that would you teach the same tactics to juniors as you would to seniors, taking into account the differences in size, the height, and uh, potential power delivery, etc. Uh, you mean? Would you change the tactics? How, how would you teach them to play doubles, taking into account their physical expertise, maturity, their muscle strength, etc. Or would you just teach juniors exactly the same way as you would teach uh, seniors? No, uh, I think every, everyone's different, different style of play and uh, different style of swing. So of course, it's the, I'm not going to, everyone holding racket also different. So I go more to individuals and uh, if, they are, if their swing is different, then uh, I can teach them in di different way. It's not totally same like, the senior play this, they are playing this. I see the same uh, technique there, but in terms of tactics, would it be different? Uh, of course, uh, different. Uh, junior's level and the senior level is different. So junior is uh, more to a uh, more to a uh, physical style, you know? more, more to physical strength and need to build up their foundation. For a tech, uh, for senior, normally foundation they are strong. We 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 need to tell them uh, more more to tactical game and uh, uh, planning game. Kenneth, would you like to come in on that difference between junior and senior tactics? Yeah, uh, I think Richard, you have a point because of of course you have to uh, take into consideration the the possibilities and the abilities players have on a certain level, on a, in a certain age, for actually being able to to do certain tactics, which actually would ac acquire some physical skills, some technical skills. One of my main uh, approaches to this question is that even though uh, the right tactic in the youth uh, groups could be different, from the senior players. As far as I can, I try to implement the, the, the tactics that are the same as seniors and youth players, as far as I can do it, because we look, I look at this as an investment. This is not easy, because if you use senior tactics, 100% in youth levels, then they'll uh, experience a lot of unfortunate situations, probably. I know that, but maybe a compromise, for me anyway, could be that you correct or adjust the, we are trying to do this in Denmark actually in our under 13 uh, groups, we are making new games for the, for the children so they don't compete on adult premises. But to teach them in the youth groups a totally different tactics from what they are going to use in three years, I think that would be a mistake actually. But this is not, this is a tricky one because do you go for the short success, then you teach them what is uh, the right way to play when you are 10 years and you are 2 meters high, then just smash at everything. But if you invest in the future, maybe you, uh, you try to be a little bit smarter than that. But it's not easy and I don't have the, the total fixed answer for this. Got a microphone here? Thank you. Thank you. A question to the ladies, to Xu and P. What are the personal characteristics you believe a lady or a woman has to have in order to reach a top elite level? Is there anything that is extraordinarily important for you as women? Well, it's a, it's a tough question. Um, do you see these top athletes, they're different. They have different personalities, different characters. They can all become successful. I find it's quite challenging to, to say, but I think you should need to be uh, very determined. Um, I just I can give myself as an example. I, I'm not really afraid of going on court and lose my game. I can use a game to experience something uh, that I try to use things that I've been working on. Um, 
course, so the character that I've developed is, I think it's because I came out of the socialism system. I take control of my life. And I got higher, like my, I get higher self-esteem. Whereas in China, I was more told what to do. And well, you do this because I tell you to do. And your parents also, that's for the whole environment, also the, uh, the education system. And uh, you just, yeah, we are more, I would say compared to Euro Europeans, we are more submissive. And just, yeah, I have to obey the law just because I'm told to. I don't really challenge coaches. So on court, being on court, you actually are alone. You have to find a way to solve the problems. The character, I think, if you talk about that, I think you need to be very independent. Independent working on court by yourself. It's my experience. They think um, the young lady singles, some young ladies, they don't like to play competition. They don't want to compete. Uh, they have less com attitude, uh, competition attitude than the boys. So in the training, we were thinking about maybe um, trying to make more cooperation to focus on technical or tactical improvement and then winning experience. But in, in the way you go to the top level, you still have to have the winning experience and, and I mean, want to go into for the competition. But still, in the beginning for the young uh, athletes, I think we have to uh, bring them to focus. Uh, for the, those, those that naturally want to compete, like to, to play games and uh, to win. But some other ladies come here for get some socialize or get some improvement. She, she, more focus on this time. I think we have to try to adapt to individual, the character, individual character, to try and help them to reach the top level. But uh, maybe uh, for those who is not really, uh, really looking for the competition in the beginning, I mean, when they're young, then maybe try and find the way to make them focus on different things and to, to keep them on the training. And maybe in later on, they will more like to compete when they are going to the court. I think this is a really interesting topic and Wei Wen said something really interesting at the start there. She said when you look at all the top players, they all have character. And when you think back to John Neal's presentation yesterday about how critical for him in sport the development of that character is outside the court, that's really interesting. The other point I would like to make, that was again brought up by both of them, was the difference in the system when they were developing as players in China and when they've come into Europe. What we're seeing in ladies singles today, I would say, I do a little bit of commentary, still involved on the coach education side, ladies singles is actually the most interesting event of the five today, clearly for me. And why is that? It's because we can identify with different characters, different personalities, and they're all different. They have different styles of play, but also different characters and personalities. And that makes it a really, really interesting event at the moment. If we go back 10 years, it was actually quite difficult to differentiate between the top ladies singles players. And to be honest, as a spectator, it was less interesting. So there's some links there between the different presentations that we've been having from the practical badminton experts, but also from the non-badminton experts last night that were also talking about the important aspects of developing the individual and developing character. Next after question. Your, yeah, sorry, oh, after sorry. your question, because everybody says the top athletes are difficult to manage. <laughs> All the top athletes have very strong personality. They have very characters. Yeah. So it's working as a coach, I think it's hard to deal with top athletes. I, that's what I can tell you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's, uh, my question is for uh, Mr. Tan. Uh, we already spoke a little bit about this, uh, about the front player in men's doubles. Uh, if you would design a front core player, would you want him to play, cover the whole net or only parts of the net? Yeah, of course. Uh, of course, we want the, the setter if uh, in, in doubles. If you are now, now, now there you see, 
everyone have a good smash attack. And everyone also have a very good defense as well. So we need the finishing. So the finishing is more, of course, the, the front player is more important. So we still need the front players uh, to play a bigger part. Yeah, but the question is, do you want him to, to cover the whole net or just one side? 70%, I want the front players to cover more on front. I, I meant uh, sideways. Yeah, yeah, as well, yeah. as well, yeah, 70%. Because they are expert in front play. Kenneth, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, just, just a small comment on that, it's just an interesting question, but I think it depends entirely on the situation, how much of the net the front player should cover. If, if you return a serve, as an example, on the back player, in theory, you have to cover the whole net afterwards. If you return the serve to one of the co corners and move back into your own area, then actually your, uh, both players cover the net. Uh, if you put pressure as a net player on one of the corners, really 100% pressure, then in theory, you only as a net player cover this little area and the back player moves up and cover the rest. So it, de it depends entirely on the situation. Yeah? In my perspective anyway. Next, next question. Uh, this is uh, basically on men's singles. Uh, I want to know, uh, is there any uh, specific exercise uh, to train the kids to have a foundation on their footwork, uh, uh, like changing legs and pushing the, the left leg forward and ch changing the legs and move forward from back? Is there uh, any specific exercise that we can have a foundation that they can grow up and be better? Uh, because if we teach something entirely different when they're like 15, 16, uh, they can't catch up with. Uh, uh, is there any ex uh, specific drills or exercise? I don't know whether I should ask this on the court. <laughs> I, th I, think, uh, I think it's an interesting question. I'm not sure whether there's a difference between men's and ladies' singles with that question. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because it's, it's, same, it's, same. It, it's the introduction of it how you, and how you introduce footwork for young players yes. so that they're going to yes. be equipped because later on. Because especially if you look at the top players like uh, Linda has a, has a, a different footwork. Taufik had a, has yep. a, has a really good foot footwork it's, uh, which they have grown up with, so which makes the men singles players to play uh, in, in, in a better level and take the shuttle early as possible. Uh, yeah, okay. Why when do you want to... Yeah. Um, see, I think footwork is one of the area you see there are different styles, right? Even I teach, I find it, because I get a lot of questions, and say, should I just jump in or should I use the rotation? Should do I do the split step side by side, right foot fall or left foot fall? You get so many questions like that. This is why you see so many styles. It's, it's really, it depends on the situation. And say, if you keep your right foot can I stand up and show? Yes. So, we basically, if you serve high, you basically, for singles, you keep your right foot fall. That tells me you probably won't have the access to all four corners. Say, so once I sta stand, start standing like that, what do you think? What do you think if I'm standing like that? Is it easy for me to get to this corner, especially for ma women singles? It's a lot harder. That means I'm anticipating more my on my forehand side, because that gives you, gives me more, uh, I can get to the corner much quicker, yeah? With side by side, I think you can access anywhere. But say, if you do a net, you're coming back from the net, you're anticipating a return in front court, what footwork would you use? I use, I keep my right foot in front because I want to kill. If I push the shot a bit further away, I'm anticipating my forehand side, I would take my right foot in the back. So it depends on the situation. Seriously, it just, uh, as, a, as a young, well you start with the footwork, you start from scratch, you, till, you teach them the basics. And with the tactical content, when you should use this, at the beginning, you say, you tell them, okay, forehand, backhand, because in foot, where they, they, it's very hard for them to visualize you say okay, you're anticipating forehand when they are young, but you keep talking to them. 
uh, they, from very early age, they understand, slowly they will understand, also you, they can implement it on the court. Sometimes some players come to you, they do it subconsciously. Um, they don't know, they can't explain. But we all agree, if you want to anticipate on your forehand side, that you keep your left foot in front, you can reach to the forehand a lot quicker. Yeah, if you want to jump you know, around the head corner, you keep your right foot, that's a lot easier. If you lift cross from your backhand side to the round head corner, you want to anticipate your forehand defense. It quite, it's, it's easier if you, if you lift cross, you come back this way. So it really depends on the situation. Whether you, after you do a, you jump through, you want to do a chassis step forward, you use a running step forward, it depends on the situation. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. To teach all the different situations to your players, so they are able to change in the different uh, footwork in, in situation. But uh, also, they have when they make the choice to anticipate, they have to accept if they are not the shadow not going to where the anticipation. They are be late afterwards. They will not be panic. Okay, that's not in my pan. You know what, what I'm thinking about. They will play like uh, with the panic, but they have to accept that they are late in the other side and play. You know. Uh, to get ready again. So, I mean, you, some player maybe uh, not prefer to anticipate in too much because they don't want to be late in the other side, but uh, there's some tactical choice to do. So you have, when you do this choice, uh, you have to accept that some other also yeah. other disadvantage. So. Yeah, I think it's all, it's all about efficiency. I think when we play together, I just find that Hong Yan's footwork is more efficient than they save a lot of energy. It's really about efficiency. What is right, what is wrong? I mean, yeah. you can get to that corner with this footwork, yeah, that footwork. What is the most efficient way to get there? The and you save you a lot of energy. The saving energy, that is very important because the footwork saves a lot of energy. That's right. Because the correct footwork, the fastest footwork, it is, it is very important. But yeah, yeah. The most important also, you should not move in too much your body, you know, keep your body you know, stable and uh, trying to transmit your power in the legs and uh, get more efficient in the movement. And, and I think that's an important point because here we've gone into a little bit of detail. To go back to your original question, I think there, there's an important point here. That when you start with very young players, there are some core skills that you need to introduce as soon as possible. So you want starting, stopping, lunges, chasse. You need to get those movements into fun situations, into warm-up situations, into everything you do as soon as you can. So you, you get in the core ingredients so that later on you can go into the detail. If you start going into the detail and the players are not comfortable with the basic movements and the coordination of the basic movements, then you're going to get problems. So it's important to pick out what those core elements are and introduce them as soon as you can in every warm-up you do, warm-downs, every, everything you do, you're trying to encourage them to get those basics ready so that then when you come to the tactical situations, it's easy for them to adjust and, and, and apply, apply the coaching, if you like. I think, I think for the start, for the start, young, young, youngster, that I'm talking about for a junior one. Yeah. I think we need to teach, uh, teach them basic things. Like, uh, like age 13 to 16, example. We don't encourage them to, to take lift weight. Is, uh, because their they they body is still growing. Their body is still growing. I think we should uh, focus more on their footwork, as you say, footwork, and the, uh, the, the timing of hitting. We are not focusing more on like uh, weights, physical, cut it down on this. Focusing more on skills, footwork, basic thing. Like I can, um, I can share some ideas, you know, last time, <laughs> When I first came to India, uh, England, I, I still remember. Yen, Yen is my boss, <laughs> so he is so worried about maybe, maybe Asian training is too hard, because Chris Aircourt was with me. He just, uh, I think, uh, doing op operation, knee operation. So he might also worry if I push too hard, he might get another operation again. So I told him, don't worry about it. I said. Of course, we have to take time to build them. We cannot straight away. We have to, as a coach, we have to monitor the players. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, 
players uh, physical players movement so i take like example uh, now i start with chris echo i do lunges let's say maybe i just do 10 times after three months maybe i increase another 15 times so this is the thing that as a coach we have to monitor the players we can't just push keep pushing them without proper planning then we might hurt the uh, we might injure the players just a little comment uh, at the footwork because my personal philosophy about footwork is actually a little bit different from what we've heard uh, until now because I strongly believe that if the players on court actually are able, and that's a little bit what also I heard Ian say, if they're able to anticipate what is going to happen next, then they, most of them will almost automatically move in the right way, almost. Some of them we have to correct and we have to take elements out and practice isolating. That's okay for me. But in my opinion, or in my experience, I have never myself from the beginning practiced isolated formal footwork with my players. And I have had a lot of the best players in Denmark from the were small. Uh, and there's a reason behind this philosophy. It's, it's my, fu my fundamental philosophy is, as John also, John Neal talked about yesterday, is this has to be fun. And if you make small children make 20 minutes of footwork on court with no shots, no racket, then they'll for sure begin to play volleyball the next day. So I try to uh, develop their anticipation skills, make them able to see I'm going to go there and they know I'm going to go there as fast as possible. And look at it, try it and see if they actually don't do the right footwork. And then if not, some of them don't, then you could take it out. That's my personal philosophy. Not everybody agrees with me on this one, for sure not. Uh, but that's how I work with this in practice, actually. Thank you, Kenneth. Uh, on the second row here. Yep. Thanks. Uh, this question is for Kenneth. Uh, Kenneth, you spoke about the importance of building up a player's self-esteem. And I think uh, John, in the previous um, talk, um, spoke about installing neural pathways through emotional events. And very often those emotional events, he said, could be negative. So mm -hmm. the example of touching a stove. Yeah. Uh, so I guess the question is, how do you find a nice middle ground of building up a player's self-esteem while challenging, challenging them to take up stressful or painful situations? Yeah, and that is really a fantastic question because when John said this yesterday, and I was sitting down there, I was thinking exactly the same. Uh, and, and of course he knew what he was talking about, about the negative uh, emotional experiences. What building self-esteem is about is actually the opposite. Building self-esteem is, uh, is about creating situations of positive emotional nature in the form of getting recognition from your surroundings. So I'm challenging a little bit actually that, that, that the approach that that, that what the only thing we remember is negative emotional uh, uh, experiences by turning it around. And of course, I have some theoretical backup of this. Is, this is not only my own opinion. Uh, so, so I'm not saying that uh, John is, uh, is not right or anything. I'm just saying maybe there are more opportunities or more possibilities for creating memorable uh, episodes that will store in your brain, actually. Bring the girls in on the self-esteem question about how you viewed your own careers and how maybe you changed in the different circumstances you were in and how you built self-esteem, if you like. Uh, I, uh, I'm sharing my experience uh, when I was young. I, um, you know, uh, I was uh, training in the National Center uh, as a second team player. I was playing with many players and um, I used to I'm usually the one who's uh, going to also beat some of the first team player, and I'm not the best of the second player, but second team player, but I was not, um, I was among the best. But on that time, um, coach was not talking much to me. So I don't know uh, if I'm good enough. I think he's not um, thinking I'm good. And, um, but uh, af uh, actually I finished my US Open, I was winning, and after I, um, I come back and coach tell me, uh, you are not good. You were not able to play the top level international. So not the top player and be yeah good player. So you have to go back to your province. On that day, since that day, I go back to province. I lose to everyone because 
he's, I was not believing myself. He think I'm not good enough, and I think I'm not good enough. I lose all my motivation. Motivation is really important. And then I get a chance to come to Europe. And I trained with, um, I would stay in the Lian Yin's house. He's a Chinese coach in Denmark. And then uh, I training in the academy uh, with other players. And then Camilla at that time also trying to ask me to go into training as a sparring with her. Um, by training with those people, and people tell me, you are good. Actually, you, you can be better. You can beat so many players. You're good. And then I also training with Camilla, and I can beat her sometimes in training. So then I start to feel more confident. And I feel like, OK, actually, my game is doesn't change any uh, from that time. But because I have more confidence, then I play the, world, the international tournaments. I can win most of them. I mean. You know, what's changing is only self and it's, it's not my game on that time in the beginning. But of course, after I get uh, changed. But I think the coach um, can make some difference. If coach trying to more encourage your, your players, say more uh, positive words to them and to believe them, I think the, the player is more confident on themselves. What well, I then, think. Would you like to share I a little bit actually, of your experience? Uh, I have similar experience when I was I well I started playing badminton when I was ten and thir when I was thirteen I became a professional badminton player. From that day on, I got criticized that uh, about things. It's really devastating. You get criticized about things that you really can't change. So it's like, well, I'm short. I'm always short. <laughs> <laughs> I won't grow. But then they didn't give me opportunities. My I fought so hard. I got selected to the national team, and I was there. I just realized I was just a sparring partner. Although I won the uh, bronze medal at the national games, which is really, really tough, uh, competing with all these national players. So you get told every single day you are short. I said, well, you, you don't need to remind me every day. I need to work hard. I know about it, but I don't need one, anyone to keep telling me that. That hurts my self-esteem a lot. So um, I was, uh, you know, in this Chinese system, I have to obey. But naturally, I'm not a person who really agree with whatever my coach says. I'm always a bit rebellion. I got into a lot of trouble. So I thought, either I'm going to quit or I have to make a change. So that's the first time I made the decision. I had a lot of pressure from my parents from the coaches, why are you leaving the national team? Are you crazy? That's the only, pr that's the only way for you to, to win anything in the international stage. Because in China, you can't just, re just play for China from a well, provincial team. They won't let you. So I said, I have to fight. Otherwise, I give up my social life, give up my, uh, my, uh, my family life. So I just moved to Beijing. I want to achieve something. Then I decided to look for a badminton club overseas. Then I emailed, I sent a lot of emails out. But then I got a reply from one of the German clubs. And then finally I got to Europe. Then from that, that day on, because I start taking a lot of control of my own life, because I have to organize a lot of things. You buy a train ticket, you organize a flight, you have to, you know, these things, like maybe everyone thinks that you do it like daily. You, you, you cook for yourself, you clean your house for yourself. But we don't do that in China. So I was not so independent. After coming uh, to Germany, I, um, I get the opportunity to talk to the coaches and then we communicate. I feel like first time I feel we are equal. They listen to me. You feel not you are more recognized. You are trusted. You are loved. So when I was in China, I feel like Thank you. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> On the third row there, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, if you have to select a kids in early age for development program or your own personal investment as a coaches, 
what would be the two things that are extraordinarily important for you as a coach is to look like? And that's an open question for all four of you. Thank you. Kenneth, do you want to kick off? We actually, we had a new uh, sport director in Danish Badminton uh, a, a year ago or something. And he and I together, uh, we are changing our talent ident identifying strategy at the moment actually. Because earlier, it had been a matter of trying to identify the talent as early as possible, actually. And we had talent groups and practices for under 11, under 13. But we actually, we are changing this right now so, so that we don't have any formalized uh, association groups before they become 15 now. And then we let them play and we let them practice and we let them experiment and we let them grow into talents and the philosophy is, Stefan, that we don't believe that we can actually identify anything before they're in a certain age. Because there are the, all those uh, physiological differences, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, when you begin to look at uh, if there are talents when they become a little older, yeah, you look at the whole package, of course, because what is a talent? There's really many definitions on what is a talent and nobody found the golden answer because there is no golden answer on this. Of course, we look at their technical skills, we look at their ability to change grip, uh, short swings, we look at their ability to, uh, to make deceptions connected with their ability to anticipate all the things I talked about yesterday also. We look at how does this person interact actually with the surroundings. Do they just do what they're told or are they a critical person? And can we help them develop those skills? So really, it's a good question, Stephen, but the, an the answer for me is really complex, actually. And you always risk, and that's why we, we raise the, 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 the age before we begin to do this, you always risk to be wrong. And that's a catastrophe. Because if we are wrong, and you say, you, you can't, you are too short, you, you, you will never learn this, then they'll quit. And the main philosophy in Denmark now, we have changed it the last three, four years, while I've been in the board, we don't care if they win. Victor Axelsen, actually, I don't know if you know, he just beat Chen Long in the semifinal. 21-9, 21-10. Wow. But I don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> of course I do. I'm happy. That's another pound in the tin. I know. That's another pound in the tin. But the most important thing is that that kid from the beginning and until he's 40 uh, or so, uh, 85, he thinks this is fun, then he'll win tomorrow if we think that. Yeah. You probably you kn you knew what I would answer to this, Stephen. Yeah. I think it's interesting. Uh, when I came back to England, I looked around at what was happening in England and, and at the top level, and then I did a coaches conference and I, I sat in front of all of the coaches that are involved at regional level, county level, and the first question I asked them was, "Okay, I've got I've got two players here. I've got one quite flamboyant, quite gifted with the racket, but a bit lazy, doesn't work very hard." not concentrated, doesn't always listen to you. And I've got this guy over here, he's a little bit, he's less talented, but technically okay. This guy works really hard. This guy works hard. Okay, which one, which one do you want to work with? So I'm gonna ask you the same question. Do you want to work with um, this player over here? So votes for this player over here. Or do you want to work with this player over here? Anybody going to commit? You want to work with the really gifted one, or you want to work with the one that works really hard that's less gifted? Okay, votes for the gifted one. The answer is both, maybe. The English coaches, 90% of them went for the one that works hard. Okay, then I looked at the actual England team at that time, and I said, okay, so you wouldn't have worked with Nathan Robertson, you wouldn't have worked with Simon Archer, you wouldn't have worked with Robert Blair. You wouldn't probably have worked with Gail Ems because they were difficult, strong characters. And the art of good coaching is learning how to coach these characters and get the best out of them. And it overlaps on a lot of the things we were talking about yesterday. And the girl, the girl said it very well, you know, in China, you do it this way. Everybody does, mainly does the same things. They do very, very similar things. So their personalities don't come out their character doesn't come out. But at the end of the day, when you get to the top, who do you want serving at 20 all in the third of a world, world championships? Do you want the guy with a bit of flair and a bit of confidence, or do you want the guy who's the hard worker? 
for me at the time, I wanted, a, I wanted more Nathan Robertsons. Uh, that, he's where I went, why well, I've got no hair and I'm very grey, but, but they're the guys that are probably going to do it for you. You don't always win, you lose some, you lose some of them, but you have to try. And the test of the, the very best coaches for me is the guy that can get inside these guys' heads and motivate them to work hard and give them direction so that they can express themselves and they always feel challenged and they always feel motivated to work. That's really important. Many, many coaches will always go and give more attention to the ones that work hard. And they're not always going to be your best talents. Because that's the safe way to do it. It's the safe because way to do it. Many of us, all of us probably, we are a little bit nervous when people, they question our knowledge, our experiences. But in fact, this is probably the only way we can learn from each other if, at, if we accept that we question each other's uh, experiences and knowledge and everything. The safe way is to choose people who do what they're told, but not necessarily the most interesting way. On the fourth row on this side, yeah. Hi, um, this is maybe leading on uh, a bit from what you just said there, uh, Ian. It's a question for Tan, Kim Ha. Um, if you look at men's doubles currently, um, the game's a lot about sort of power and speed and a lot of the athletes, you know, are six foot plus, very tall, very, very big. Um, but if you currently look at the top of men's doubles at the moment, it's got two Indonesian players, and forgive me, I can't remember their names exactly, um, who are sort of, yes, quite small. Um, uh, but in, in my opinion, from what I can see, they're, they're very skillful. Um, they look for the gaps and um, are very good in the driving game and seem to have good perceptual skills. Um, do you think, in terms of men's doubles, that there needs to be um, more of an emphasis on looking for players like this by countries, like, like Ian has, has done in the past with the England team? Or is the way that the game is going, is it going down sort of a power, power and speed route? Okay. Uh, first of all, each country is different. Every country is different. European style of playing is different. Asian player style is different. It depends, uh, as I say, uh, Asian are more short, shorter than uh, Europeans. So our hand is more s shorter than the European. So let's say, example, if I, yeah, some of my Indian players are tall also as well. So I told them, you are tall. The Asian one is short, but the hand is uh, shorter. If you play too much drive with them, who, who is more advantage? Uh, the shorter players, the Asian players. Yeah, because their, their hand is shorter, they can swing more faster. So you can't, no matter how also you can't play too much drive with the shorter fuller. You know, they are more advantage. What you can play is drive, drive, then you control. And also when you come to defend, if Denmark, I think Denmark now also improve a lot. Last time, they can't just keep keep like this. If you go like this more every time, Asia they can keep attack, attack, attack because physically is why we can move faster. So what you can see, uh, Denmark players, I'm sure they drive one time, two time, they will start block. Asia like Korea and Japan, even China, they they can keep drive, drive, drive. If you drive with them, you are playing to their game. So we have to use a lot of tactical game how if I play against this opponent, we are not going to use, we, we can't play too, too much drive with the Korean. Or we can't, too, we can't play uh, too, too controlling games with the uh, European. So how you manage? Okay, so, so do you think in terms of looking <laughs> for players maybe in this country or Euro European countries that there needs to be uh, more of an emphasis on looking for different types of players. So then we have, you know, a player who is, you know, very fast but very powerful. But then we have another player who is very skillful. Do we need to be looking for combinations in that way, or can there be any combinations? And like you say, is it just any style of play? Can you know, if the right kind of management and the right kind of coaching has been given, can can win and, and win, you know, uh, medals. 
I'd like to say one word on that, if that's okay. I think we've been through phases, if you look back over the last 20 years. There was a phase clearly where in China, ladies singles, they were looking for tall ladies singles players. If we look at the Chinese men's doubles now, uh, they're coming out with some really, really big guys. But we're not basketball. And the game evolves and the tactics evolve and people have found ways to deal with it. And then when you look at the Olympics, Marcus Ellis pops up and wins a medal. In a men's, in a game, in the, if you looked at the quarterfinals, the average size was probably above 190. You've got Marcus at 175, he's won a medal. And that's one of the beauties of our sport. We're never going to be basketball where it's going to be dominated by the big guys because they adapt. And if you look at that Indonesian pair, the young boy there is a guy that is, will possibly be the catalyst to, for, men's, for world men's doubles to make the next step because he's doing something different. And people are going to have to react to it, and they're already reacting to it. So the game will go up again. Like Lee Yun Day did with the front court play, this guy's going to move it again. And what size is he? About 172. So I think that's one of the beauties of our sport, actually. On the fourth row in the red there. Thanks. Hi, this uh, kind of goes to you, Kenneth, I think in particular, but I'd love to know uh, what the whole panel think about a grading system for the young kids that are just coming into the game to keep them, to keep them motivated, to help build their self-esteem. Um, we don't have a grading system in badminton, really. Uh, you know, we have it in karate. Um, some of the kids that come to my club are involved in football. They're rewarded with different colored socks as they go up the grades in football. Um, do you think maybe we could introduce this into badminton? and introduce different grades. So even if kids don't go on to play in tournaments, they can see rewards, they can still, they can go forward um, on a social level and say, I'm a grade 12, I'm a grade 14, and, and take pride in where they get to without getting to elite and national levels. Uh, just watch the panel's thoughts. That's a good question also, actually. Um, you remember John Neal yesterday, he said that let them compete all you can, and I agree totally. There's such a big motivation in the competition in itself. The trick here is, and that's also what he said, all research shows that if they can compete without being focused only on winning, then that's the optimal situ situation actually for being able to win. About, and when you say greeting system, it's about uh, Giving a reward, maybe yeah, reward a, a and kid all comes in and after yeah, three months they can say. Yes, I understand. I, I, I actually have a really strong opinion on, on this one, actually. Um, <laughs> I also, I, I often, when I practice my players, do small competition with small rewards and everything. Uh, but it's always sim symbolic rewards. It's like the winner don't have to pick up that shuttle and put it in the trash uh, bin or whatever. Symbolic rewards. Because I strongly believe we have to find a model where the, the children, especially the children, uh, they, they do this because they are motivated from the inside, intrinsically motivated, and they compete because it's fun and everything. Um, and when you reward people, if it's really rewards, you make them, you think they really want to have, you give, I give you 100,000 pounds or whatever, then the focus from uh, the, 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 yeah, the perspective to motivation shifts immediately. And then you will be uh, extrinsic motivated. And every research no, uh, shows that if you do that, then it'll, uh, it'll uh, have a consequence for their experience of the game, for the, the way the, 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 their motivation, their, their, their reasons for going on to court. Not because it's fun, because, but because it, they want to have the tournament, uh, the money, sorry. And also, and that's the beautiful of this, if you are extrinsically motivated, you want to get into the paper with money, then your performance level will fall, actually. So everything says, in my mind, and also every research shows, that if you can make systems where they are intrinsically motivated and the rewards are symbolic, and more have character of recognizing them for something they have done. You understand what I mean? 
then we would be in a good position because they would go on playing badminton because it's fun and actually they would, they, they would become at a, they would perform better. So for me, this is a win-win. The difference between re really serious external rewards like money and everything, and okay, you don't have to clean, uh, clean up your court because you did well, recognition. Yes, I, I, I agree with that. It's just in the Japanese system of, of karate, for instance, white belts and black belts. Yeah. But when karate was brought over to the West, yeah, yeah we had to start introducing yellow yeah. belts and purple and yeah. green and brown because Western culture, we, do, we are not happy being nothing until or something. We, can, we want to, we, I think we want to have increments, don't we? Um, and I was just wondering if you thought at a very, I'm not talking performance level, at the start, at the very start, do you think it would be worth introducing something like that? Uh, maybe. There are a number of countries that have tried this. There are a, there are a lot of systems out there if you, if you do the research. Uh, a lot of European countries have tried, and even one or two Asian countries have tried this. But to be honest, there isn't one that stood the test of time uh, for various reasons. And, and the reason is that it, it gets accelerated. So the kids focus purely on the next award, and they get a very narrow focus. And that's not what you want. You want, a, you want, a, you want a broad, broad focus. You're trying to make it a, a holistic, fun experience for them being in our sport. And all they're looking at is, right, I've got to hit five high serves into that box and I get another badge. And exactly. it's, it's probably not going to make them a better player. No. At a club level, at very basic level, do you want to challenge them to do that? Yeah, you do. Perfect. But uh, actually, what you do by introducing award systems like that is you narrow the focus. And that's, that's not all, well, it's it probably not a healthy situation for our sport, which is such an open skill sport with so many variables. And I think we, we're touching on that a lot yesterday and today. We, you know, we're one of the very few sports with so many performance variables in it that to narrow it down at that young age, I think, is quite dangerous. I understand it. And I could just to finish this off, we, we have in Denmark, like many other countries, a system where our youth players, they, if they collect points, they can move up in the grades. Probably many countries have this. And actually, we have a task force looking at how can we change this system now. Because everything they talk about, everything they write on Facebook is, oh, I won uh, uh, under 13 E uh, group, now I can move up in the C group. Wow, congratulations. And so what? That's my question, so what? So we are trying to see, can we change this so we can, as Ian also said, we can uh, change the focus from this reward points, whatever, to something that's more lasting and much more fun maybe. Yeah? Okay, we've got to, I'm um, sorry we've got to call it a day, but everybody will be around during the lunch break. I'd really like to thank the panel. I'd particularly like to thank uh, Hong Gan and Wei Wen for opening up about their experiences in China when they were younger. It's not always easy. And I'd like a good round of applause for the whole panel, please. Thank you. Any, any housekeeping, John? Yes, just